morning and welcome to CosmoQuest Community Coffee for today, Monday, December 28th, in the year that still shall not be named, but is almost over. Uh, we just have three more days to go and and it's, uh, it's a new year. Um, so uh, first things first, before I get into the show, I have to say a huge thank you some anonymous wonderful person gifted about 10 gift subs and so you get a happy dance for that thank you so much um thank you so much for yourselves this is how the cosmo quest world goes around but in the meantime i'm just gonna get straight into the show which i'm super excited about um, most of the cosmo quest programming is on break this week um, which I didn't know about. So I went ahead and scheduled uh, this uh, session for today and I'm just super stoked about it. Um, my guest today is um, astronaut, aquanaut, artist, and earthling, Nicole Stott, um, who has uh, served a couple of times on the ISS and has the incredible work around uh, art and healing and space art um, and just a wonderful guest. So thank you so much for being here, Nicole. Thanks, and let me, here, I'm gonna shut my door real quick. I just had to let the dogs out. Okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the joys of the at-home coffee chat, huh? <laughs> yes, the joys of the yes. at-home, you know. The, I don't have pets, but um, Cosmo Quest often has pets on stream almost all the time. There's dogs or cats or something happening. Yeah, you'll catch ears going by at some point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, it's That's great to be here. Thanks for including me. You're, yes, you're very welcome. Um, so uh, I, I, I do, you know, I have your bio and, and you, it's obviously, you know, you've, you've kind of um, just done some really incredible things along the way, but um, I want to ask you particularly about the art and kind of how it's been weaving in and out of your work across the years. Um, so I guess the first question is, you know, how did that start? You know, were, were you always painting or did it kind of come in along the way or how did that work? Well, I think it really has been with me always. And I just in general go back to thinking, you know, where we're all inspired by things. And for me, it started with, you know, parents that shared what they loved with me. And that's everything that got me, you know, my dad liked to build and fly small airplanes. That got me really thinking about flying, which ultimately led to the, I think, to the space flight uh, opportunities. If I go back, you know, as far as I can to what got me going on that. And my mom uh, growing up was really creative. I, I mean, she sewed like all of mine and my sister's clothes growing up. I can't oh, even wow. imagine. I mean, I can barely make it to Target for my <laughs> son's <laughs> underwear or something, let alone think about sewing all his clothes. And if I was going to get to a ballet lesson or if I was going to make it to softball practices, because she got me there. And when I was growing up, you know, she was doing things like macrame and hooked rugs and pottery, and she would involve uh, me and my sisters in that. And it just kind of became this, you know, I think it's all about the things we end up enjoying. And I painted, I liked woodworking, I liked building things. And I know I just kind of kept it with me all the time and then was able to take a little paint kit to space, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, absolutely. And so was that kind of, uh, was that in the plan from the beginning that, you know, you were going to go and paint in space? Or w was it kind of, you know, bring it along as an extra thing? Like, how, did you did you plan to like, I'm going to go and paint? No, absolutely not. It was definitely not part of the plan. It was more... Uh, again, I'm thankful to someone because uh, my friend Mary Jane Anderson, who was also one of my ground support people, she helped get all of our flight crew equipment together to fly. And she was also the person that helped us. Put, we had like this little bag that you could take personal items in. Right. And I mean, I thought about things like my son, who was seven at the time, his little stuffed animal and a T-shirt from my high school and some pictures of family and friends and things like that. And maybe my favorite book and a Sudoku puzzles or something to take with me, but I wasn't really thinking beyond how do I share this, you know, immediately with other people by the stuff I took. And she reminded me, she's like, Hey, Nicole, you know, you're going to be living and working, not just working, living in space for, you know, months. 
why don't you think about something that you enjoy down here on earth that maybe you could take with you? And that's where the paint kit came in. I just found this little watercolor paint kit and thought up, oh, you know, maybe if I have time, I'll paint while I'm there. And I, it was weird because somewhere along the way, one of my friends who I'd worked with as an engineer for years um, with the shuttle program, who also very cool guy, Ron Woods, who was like suited up the Apollo astronauts to go walk on the moon. He's a wonderful artist. And I took his brush, his paintbrush with me. And that's what I painted with when I was in space. And so it was absolutely not planned in any way. If I could go back, I would actually videotape the whole process and I would bring home my paint kit. <laughs> Two things I didn't do that would have been, if there had been a plan, I think that would have been. Um, what happened to the paint kit? Well, I hope it's still up there. I have, um, I have a picture of it. You know, it's kind of in the background on the wall when I was painting. And so I have my friends up there, you know, I send them, your most important mission is to look for my paint kit. And people have looked before, they haven't found it, but I'm still hopeful that um, I'm That's counting on awesome. Shannon Walker, who's up there right now to do a really good search for it, but uh, bring <laughs> it's it probably home. like, you know, stuffed under something. Or I don't know. I hope it didn't end up in some you know, cargo trash vehicle that burnt up in the atmosphere. I mean, I can't imagine it. It would bother me if that did happen because I think about it, you know, we've, we've had music and art going on in space since the very beginning. And there's key, a keyboard up there and a guitar and a flute. And I can't imagine anybody thinking, oh, I'll put that in a, the trash, the trash vehicle right. to send away. So why would they do that with, you know, with paint? But you yeah. never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it just brings up so many questions, but let me just focus on one for a minute. Uh, a little too, there's like too many going on. But, so let's just go back. You know, before you before you well, you know went up to the ISS. So you, um, you know, you had a lot of different training and going on. And and did the paints did they come with you throughout that whole process, or was it something that you kind of used to relax, or you no? Know, uh, well, I mean, as I was, I mean, training for years to go to space, uh, you know, of course, as human beings, we have our hobbies and stuff too, outside of, of just, you know, the work side of things. So yeah. I always was doing something. I got into like um, my husband very, very um, thankfully got me a, a miter saw once for Christmas. And I, um, you know, and I ended up just doing these decorative, I don't think I have one around me, these decorative boxes that I would gift to people and stuff, you know, made out of, you know, really pretty wood molding and things. And so there was always something kind of artistic, creative happening along the way, kind of as, yeah, definitely as a way to relax, to kind of separate, you know, maybe transcend what I was doing with all the really intense training and, you know, just be a, a human being who likes to do her own thing who likes, yeah, <laughs> you know, know. in preparation. <laughs> and, um, and so I think I was very fortunate to have Mary Jane remind me that I'd be living in space too, and that, that yeah. I could bring that with me, um, even in just a little way. Uh, to I, I kind of think about it like putting the human in human spaceflight, right? right? Where we don't, you know, NASA doesn't, or they've gotten better, but we don't always, as kind of the sciencey tech side of the world, think about sharing how important it is to share the human side of these people that are in space too. Uh, yeah. And I think when we can bring something we love doing on Earth to, to space with us, it, it allows us to share it that way. Yeah. And so I, I'm just thinking, though, like, you know, because I know that water behaves so differently in microgravity and like <laughs> how, you know, how do you paint watercolors? You know, <laughs> what was that like? Yeah, you know, it's it's another reason why I wish I would have activated the brain cell, you know, to, to videotape <laughs> the whole thing, because I think that whole process would have been so just beautifully descriptive of what it's just like to live in space or live in microgravity, um, you know, on the space station where everything floats, you know, you're floating, all of your stuff floats, water floats like little spheres. And the whole dynamic of that, I think, could have come out really, really wonderfully through painting in space, but I wasn't smart enough to do that. I'm thankful to my friend, Bob, you know, my crewmate, Bob, who took the one picture I have painting in space, <laughs> but it is different. And it's different, just like it's different for us to live there. You know, you've got to, 
think a little bit different spatially. You know, everything is really three dimensions, not two. And um, you're not dipping your brush into a cup of water because we don't have cups of water. So I would squirt little balls of water out of my drink bag and, you know, bring the tip of the brush to it and just kind of watch really in amazement at how this whole thing, <laughs> thing was going on. And then the science of it even came out. Like before I would even get the tip of the brush to the ball of water, it's like the water wanted to move onto the end of the brush. And then it just kind of floated there. And I don't know if there was some, you know, interesting attractive force going on or if it was because of the way surface tension behaves in space, but it, it would do that. And then, you know, I carry that ball of water down to the paints and it's like the paint sucked the water to it. It was really weird to watch this whole thing. And I think the two other things that were, were especially interesting about it to me were that um, you'd have that colored ball of water on the end of the brush. And I would, I immediately, like I do here on earth, wanted to touch the tip of the brush to the paper to drag, you know, the tip of the brush along the paper. But if you did that, all that colored water just was a blob that just went immediately <laughs> and got sucked into the paper. And so it was kind of like you were dragging this colored ball of water along the paper not painting with the brush, but using it more as a way to just drag the, the colored water along. So that, that had to be, you know, treated differently. And then everybody thinks, you know, I, what I have painted in space and what I try to concentrate myself down here is on views of earth, you know, the view I saw at the window. And I was like, oh, did you sit in front of a window and paint what you were seeing? And it's like, well, that had been nice. <laughs> <laughs> but there really was no plain air painting in space because what you'd want to paint would be gone, you know, at five miles right. a second, it would be gone before you could get the, the brush or the blob of water to the, the paper. So you had to take a picture and, you know, work on it that way. But really, really thankful for that, that experience. Um, yeah. yeah. And so was that, was that on the first trip or the second trip that, that kind of that was on the first trip because my first trip was a little over three months. And so the thought, you know, to even have the opportunity to do it, um, it needed to be kind of uh, part of that time frame. When I was there on my second flight, which was a little over two weeks, um, okay. there's no, there, you're just hustling, you know, you're living there, you're working there, but you just are so focused on getting everything done that it, you're not, you don't really get into a rhythm of, of life the same way you do on a longer duration one. Okay, leaning my head out to open the door to let them in now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. That, that's totally fine. Um, interesting, okay. So that it was, it's kind of when, you know, when, you're, when you're there as, as living the life that when it, it kind of comes in as the, as the art. Um, and so since you've, uh, you know, obviously since you've been back, you've, you've done a lot of different work with these foundations and the Space for Art Foundation, which I want to talk about also. But, you know, are, are you still painting these days? Like, are you still creating stuff or, you know, doing your own practice? I am. I, painting, not as much as I would like to. I don't think we ever get to do as much as we would like to of those of those kinds okay. of things. Yeah. And I, I am still creating. I've been working very, very diligently. My book coach would be happy for me to say that on my, um, my first book. So that's really been the focus over the last probably year or so is pulling that manuscript together. And, um, and that is a very creative process, not one that I am, um, quite as naturally <laughs> writing is so you know, hard to it's so different it's isn't so it difficult it is yeah, yeah. and just and trying I, to like take a, an experience which is so much more than words and boil it down to just words is very difficult I find it is it's it's really really difficult and it's um and I I'm you know I'm so thankful to Rob and my my book coach for for helping me kind of think about the way to form those words so that, that people experience what, what I'm trying to show. It's, it's, you know, this idea of storytelling, I guess, more than just dictation and diary kind of thing or journaling. And uh, it's been a real, man, it's been a real experience. I, I kind of use the words, the pleasure is the pain and you know, I'm taking the fork out of my eye now, you know, those kinds of things, but I think it'll be worthwhile too, you know, and, and hopefully like the art, I look at it kind of that way. It's like my whole motivation in 
aside from the joy it brings me, it, you know, creating something like a painting based on the experience I had is that I think it's such, I mean, you with your dance and all of the other artistic things you do and, um, and share, it's like, we're given this opportunity to share those experiences in a unique, I think interesting way that can draw people in that never may have even been interested in a space station or right. the work that's being done there that's all about improving life on earth. And if I can draw people in through a painting that they might not, I mean, they might not even like it, you know, but if I can get them interested in the backstory of how right. that all came about, you know, to me, that's really important. And and I think the book is another way to do that too. And is the book, it's, uh, it's, it's a memoir? Is it focusing particularly on that space flight or like what, what's, what's that all about? Yeah, it's not memoir. I, you know, if I do a memoir-y thing, I've never wanted to do that. I've never wanted to say, oh, here's how Nicole became an astronaut kind right. of thing, you know? Yeah. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I, I kind of look at that like, okay, that could be the kid's book. You know, I could do something that's really inspirational for kids maybe and just focus on particular points of that. But for me, it was more important, just like with the art, with the paintings, I think, is to share the experience in a way that people make their own connection to it, that there is this reality of how what we've done in space is yeah. such, I mean, such this perfect, wonderful example for how we should be living like a crew here on Spaceship Earth. Um, how we should be crewmates, not passengers, how, you know, we've, we've done this really, I think, miraculous thing of coming together as 15 different countries with the International Space Station and built this mechanical spacecraft that we've done our best to mimic what Earth does for us naturally, right? And we're every day acutely aware of how much CO2 is in our atmosphere and how much clean drinking water we have and the integrity of our thin metal hull and it's just so perfectly, <laughs> just this perfect analog to how we should be living here on earth on this planet, you know, with our thin blue atmosphere and all the resources that we share together as, as earthlings. So it's kind of that, how, what we've been doing in space, you know, bringing it back to earth. How can we take those ways of living and apply them here? It's not a checklist. You know, I didn't want to make a yeah. checklist either. Like thou shalt do this to be a better <laughs> earthling kind of thing. You know, it's really more, hey, here's, here's what we've learned about the way we can live peacefully, successfully. Yeah. If, you know, I mean, it's not insignificant that 15 countries, you know, not that have not always been the happiest of, you know, friends exactly. could come together and work this way because of this, this greater mission. And, yeah, you know, so we can do it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, one can, we can do a lot of stuff that we yep. don't. Um, yeah, I just, I wonder, um, you know, I, I've, you know, really never thought of, about, you know, being in space. I, you know, I kind of like my feet on the ground because that helps me do my art. <laughs> um, but, you know, is that somehow the experience of, of, you know, you talked about the fragility of, of the experience of being on the, ISS, do you find that somehow that, you know, does that translate into the artistic sort of experience of it, of, of trying to share it later, you know, somehow that, does it bring out the humanity somehow in the art more of just having that sense of the, the you know, life being so fragile here in this little thing that's... <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I think it, I think yeah, I, I, what I hope is that it gets people, you know, the three lessons I learned, I mean, I want these three lessons to be the things that come out of the art I do, of the work with the foundation, of the book, is, you know, all there's all this complexity in going to space, right? And, you know, just to get there, to live there for any amount of time, to get home safely. And, and out of that, I really, I mean, it's like kindergarten lessons, you know, we all know them when we're very young and yet we don't maintain an awareness of them. You know, this idea that we live on a planet, we are all in space already, right? You know, right. we yeah. are all earthlings, um, you know, sharing that planet. And, and honestly, the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere, right? That blankets and protects us all. And those are the the kind of common ground things that we need to maintain in our awareness. And you said something that I think is really, really powerful is this idea of our feet on the ground, right? Yeah. 
yeah. our feet, you know, so that you could create your art. You need that to have, you know, to create your art. But I like people, I, you know, next time you're dancing like that, you know, when your feet are touching the, I mean, really kind of viscerally think about the fact that that ground is a planet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. your feet are making contact with a planet that seems to just be still, you know, in, in space. And yet it's rotating, spinning at a thousand miles an hour and traveling at, well, I can never remember the speed around the sun. And, you know, all of this dynamic that's going on that keeps us alive on this planet. And, you know, and I think that's what it comes down to this connection our, of our own personal connection with earth as our home but also, you know, with every other form of life we share it with. And um, I don't really do that. And then you look up and you think, wow, that, that blue sky that seems to go on forever is really just this thin yeah. uh, veil of protecting yeah. us. Um, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and uh, so kind of taking, moving in a different direction, but I think it's quite related. So the, the Space for Art Foundation is particularly, <laughs> it's okay, there's barking on the stream a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I can hear you, keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Basically, um, the Space for Art Foundation is particularly focused on art therapy, is that correct? Yeah, and I think it is totally connected, you know? I mean, I, I remember, you know, I think about this feeling I had, um, experiencing earth from space, that view of earth as this glowing, translucent, iridescent planet, kind of this connection I made to it and how um, transcendent that really was, how healthy, you know, that it was a very grounding <laughs> thing too, to, to experience very meditative and, you know, all of those things. Um, and I'm very thankful that I was pulled into a project, you know, it was this one to make this first art suit where it was something I had not been familiar with before. I mean, I'd visited kids in hospitals and done things like that before, but never in a really kind of intimate, personal, or I think um, purposeful way too. And uh, so I was introduced to this idea of art therapy. I mean, I think you understand it through like dance and stuff too. You know, there's the healthful side of it from exercise, but also just getting people involved and whether with, they're watching you dance. Yeah. Yeah. Getting in touch with their emotions. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so, yeah. you know, what we've been doing is we've been, you know, just, we, 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 we came up with this line that we tried to figure out how do we describe this in like the simplest way. And it's like, we are working to unite this planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. And so we've been working with kids, uh, started in one hospital in Houston, a pediatric cancer center there. And now we've been working with kids in over 50 countries on our last project in hospitals and refugee centers and very rural schools um, to bring them together through these, these large format art projects. And the bulk of those have been these art spacesuits. And it's so cool. I mean, our, our, space, our company that makes our real spacesuits, ILC Dover, has been with us every step of the way, volunteering, you know, quilting together this artwork into these beautiful suits. A couple of them have actually gone to the space station. You know, we never promised that because you can't promise anything can go to space, but, um, but we've been very fortunate um, to have the kids be able to see that happen too, in one way or another. And um, it's just incredible to watch how something like space, you know, can get these kids who are going through what you hope is the worst thing they ever have to experience in their lives and allow them to think about their future. You know, even if they never want to go to space, they can imagine themselves outside of this experience they're having. And then they see their art come together with other kids around the world who are experiencing maybe something similar to them. And it gives them this, you know, this connection, this very healthful feeling. They come in and they sit up straighter and they're talking to the kids around them and to us. It's really, I am in awe of it every time I go into one of these sessions. And I'll just, you know, I, I told you I'm a rambler. I'll, I'll just say one other thing about this. You know, when I um, come into a place, uh, you know, I'm just looking like an old lady today, but you know, you put the blue flight suit on and you come in all astronauty looking, right? And somebody will always say, oh, Nicole, 
this is going to be so inspirational for these kids to have you here today and all that. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, well, hopefully, hopefully it helps them that way. Right. But I walk out of those sessions. I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it inspired in a way that I never, I, I don't think I'd felt before all of this and to see the strength and faith and yeah, I mean, courage. And we all got like our suits or hope and unity and, you know, all of the victory dreamer, all of these things that are coming out of these kids and their families. Yeah. I, I mean, I am in awe. I, I am inspired and um, it just makes you want to keep doing it too. So, yeah. so, so we are. <laughs> yes. And, and, and absolutely like it's such a beautiful mission. And so the, the bulk of, of what you do is basically they create these patches and these postcards, right. That kind of get quilted together into these, these base suits. Yeah. And what we've done up till now, what we've done with, with the spacesuit part of it is we've, Actually, the kids have actually physically painted on fabric. It's it's been oh. even with fifty countries, it was manageable enough to, for the most part, be able to get the fabric to the places and have them send it back to us. Um, sometimes not so easy. I mean, places like Morocco, where I sent the whole little package, it makes it all the way to Morocco and then gets sent back to me. Doesn't make it to the person <laughs> that was supposed to paint. So, but up till now, we've been able to do that. And the actual physical original creation of these children is sewn together into these, oh, suits, these suit covers. Just incredible. Um, the project that we're working on now, the new suit beyond, you know, with all of this COVID and isolation going on for all children, I mean, for everyone on the planet, we, we are hopeful to get kids from every country on earth um, involved. And so to do that, we're not able to send fabric out, but we're gonna be able to print their art onto the fabric in really creative ways so that they all are included. And then ILC Dover will sew that fabric together. Um, okay. Yeah. But we've also been able to do some really interesting um, uh, like electronic, I guess, video projects, animation kinds of things where you mentioned postcards. We did a project with kids, I think in 15 countries where they created these art postcards with messages to the crew on the space station. And um, this company, A Block in Germany volunteered and they created these beautiful video animations with all of the art. And we were able to send that video file to the station and they could watch that. So you didn't have to physically send anything, but the kids could see their art there. Opening the door. <laughs> uh, it's funny. So. It's a it's a day where they're going in and out and in out. It's every day. Every day they go in and out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like cats, right? They're like, oh, it's, I'm on the wrong side of the door. <laughs> once they're on the other side, they want this side. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, and so overall, that's kind of the foundation, but apart from the foundation, you also do other kind of like, um, space for space for art sort of work. I think you did an exhibition at the, the Jefferson Space Center. Was that? So we have done, we're in the, uh, towards the end of like our second exhibit and, and that's all tied to the Space for Art Foundation work too. So the, um, okay. the first one we did was at the Johnson Space Center in Houston okay. um, at that visitor complex. And now we're at the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa. And yeah, we build out these really cool exhibits where the, the focal of course is, the, it's a way for us to showcase the art the kids have done. So okay. and we just kind of bring it all together. And so we have that, but then around it, what I think is really cool is that we build out the exhibition with art for artwork from people in the area. So like at the Johnson Space Center, I pulled together, um, you know, some of my friends who you would just think of as technical, right? Like right. engineers yeah. and scientists and my exercise, you know, physiologist and um, my mission control people and other astronauts um, who were also artists. And yeah. we display that artwork around. And with the idea that people, you know, understand that the best, I mean, we need to use our whole brains, right? It's not you're a scientist or you're an artist. It's that there's this blend, I think, in all of us. And when you can showcase like the artwork of somebody who is a really like on the cutting edge of some technical thing and kids, especially when they can see, oh my gosh, I, you mean you can do science and art? You know, yes, I want you to, I want you to do that. I want you to use your whole brain. 
<laughs> and so, so we take statements from these people too, you know, how did art and science come together in your life? What was the, the impact of that for you? And I think when kids and perhaps even adults see that, they realize that, wow, it really is all about the blend of these yeah. two things and how they, they come together that can have the most, you know, the most impact on us. So, yeah, we I mean, I, I, I definitely feel like, you know, sometimes um, just as a general perception, um, people think that, you know, science, there's no room for art, you know, it's frivolous, it's not important, it's just kind of something aside. And I, I find somehow, you know, when I, I watch her talk to science, sometimes scientists are the biggest advocates for art, Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I think that's cool. And I mean, think about it. There's a really, you know, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of the NASA facilities that does all of the, you know, like sends Cassini out to Saturn and, you know, Juno to Jupiter. They're doing all of these amazing, the rovers on Mars, all these like, you know, planetary missions. And they have a place called The Studio at JPL, which is dedicated to this, like this team of, of artists and creators that work hand in hand with the scientists to not only communicate the mission in a creative way, but to help develop it in a way, get the scientists thinking about the way they think and, you know, and then how they can design these, these missions in new and, and, and better ways. And, you know, all of, I mean, I mean, like I said in the beginning, the, from the time we've gone to space, the, some of the earliest cosmonauts, uh, Alexei Leonov, like was drawing orbital sunrises with colored pencils on his first mission. And, you know, music has been played and poetry written and quilts created. I mean, you know, all of this is going on because it's, it's a human, I think, need to create that way, too. And the, the exhibition that we have going on right now, there's, you know, a scientist that you would never, I mean, I never would have imagined that this person had painter in them as well. And it's, you know, Robert Goddard, the father of rocketry in the US who, wow. you know, got us to space and he would go out and, you know, with his big hat and the easel and paint, you know, New Mexico and the countryside. And it's, it's a surprise. I think it's just a wonderful surprise to discover that kind of thing and know that, you know, even the scientists who are, I mean, at the heart of like Hubble, everybody knows Hubble Space Telescope, right? And most of us know it because of the beautiful imagery that comes back of yeah. all of these, you know, amazing places that surround us in the universe. And it's not just pretty pictures that we're looking at, right? I mean, the scientists deliberately color those images in a way to understand what gases that nebula is made of or how far away something is because they realize their brains can't just process the ones and zeros either. They need that visual, you know, to really understand it as well. And then we get really beautiful <laughs> pictures of galaxies and nebula and all of these, you know, exploding stars and things. So, yeah. That's, that's very, that's, that's so cool. Okay. Um, so I, I have um, one last question and then okay. if there are questions in the chat, um, I'll, I'll take them a couple, maybe one or two. Um, uh, but uh, basically what, in the future, if you were to imagine, you know, your ideal art science collaboration, you know, what, what would that be? Well, I think it would be that, that it was very thoughtful that, and, and a lot of this is starting to happen more and more, you know, we talk about like artist residencies at science facilities or. Yeah, I've applied for the know. artist residency at CERN. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you know, things like that, um, where that was just, a natural part of how we explore and investigate things and discover things that would be that, you know, that we're using um, the talents of all kinds of people to, to come together for that. You know, that when we go off, it's kind of like a JPL, we go off to figure out how we're going to explore, you know, some moon of Jupiter. And we're thinking right up front about how we'll creatively design that mission, how we'll creatively communicate it just right as part of the process. And, and the other thing I think about is, and this came from one of these beautiful children, to, at least for me, the reality of this came from one of these children at um, one of the first painting sessions I did 
where we're painting and she's like eight years old. She's got this colorful little flower hat on because she's lost all her hair already, you know, to chemo yeah. and stuff. And um, and we're talking about space and stuff. And all of a sudden she just looks at me and she's like, you know, Miss Nicole, what you do as an astronaut must be a lot like what I go through here at the hospital. And I'm thinking, okay, keep painting Nikki and smile and ask her, you know, what she means. Cause it, it like shocked me that this child could consider you know, what I dreamed of doing in comparison to what, you know, she's going through. Yeah. And she kept talking and she's like, yeah, you know, you don't get to eat the same kind of food and you can't see your mommy and daddy and your friends the same way. And they do all kinds of tests on you and your body's changing. And I think you have radiation, you know, and I'm like, holy moly. Wow. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, I mean, such like mind bending deepness that came from this, this young person. And, and I was like, wow, you know, and it reinforced for me that we need to keep doing these kinds of things. We need to keep working with the kids this way, you know, clinically from a, a, a health, healthy standpoint. But it also made me think about, man, you know, every human space exploration thing we've done so far, we see earth out the window. You know, we have this beautiful artist, this artwork, you know, <laughs> that's our home out the window. Even the farthest we've gone, what, 250,000 miles to the moon, yeah. you know, we have this reality of who and where we are in space right. together. And yeah. when we go to Mars, you know, 35, what, million miles away, at some point you cross that line in space where you don't see Earth as Earth, that colorful yeah. place anymore. And so it's almost like we're going to have to be creating providing these like artistic outlets, these creative outlets for those astronauts to figure out how to make that connection back to their home planet again. And I don't know, that's a Star Trek holodeck. I don't know what, you know, it's painting on your iPad. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be thoughtfully considered and built into those missions right. for the human. <laughs> yes. Yes. For the human who is going the human, not on the human yeah. space flight. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's <laughs> amazing. Um, so someone, I, there's just one question from the chat. Somebody is asking about um, music on the ISS. If there's a, if you guys have a shared playlist or dedicated music time or kind of how, how music comes into play and in life there. Yeah, there's music all the time. Um, you know, everybody brings up their own playlist. I think that's still true. And then we share them. We leave it up there. It just keeps building on itself. And you know, dinner time was interesting because we, you, somebody was, okay, you know, Ramon, bring your music list to dinner tonight. And it was really cool to hear kind of this blend of, of music from, from people, you know, from these 15 different countries actually coming together. And, and not just like playlists that way, but um, people bringing musical instruments with them to space. So there is a keyboard on the space station. There is a guitar on the space station. There's I think Katie left one of her flutes on the station and, and Chell Lindgren, one of um, my colleagues, he brought up bagpipes and played bagpipes on this, like a, you know, compact set of bagpipes and played amazing grace from the station, you know, down to earth. Wow. And incredible. <laughs> Don Pettit made like a didgeridoo out of the vacuum hose or something. I can't remember. <laughs> And so it's just pe people want to, to do that and experience it. You know, you would live, like Mary Jane said to me, you're living there. You know, you want to have that, that aspect of life with you. And I think that's just going to continue to, to grow. And, and people are thinking about how do we create music differently in space? Can we use the microgravity environment in a way that allows sounds to become different or, you know, something and there is a, a recent mission where they did like a jam session. I think it was Drew Expedition 50 something where Drew's playing the guitar and there's like a little pan flute or something. And um, somebody's got like a shake in the Moroccos and, and then using one of the solid waste containers as a bongo drum or something. I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's really good. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. Always. I think it's one of those things that it's just like, if you have a human, you cannot stop them from creating yeah. you just can't like they'll just they'll just create they'll just dance you know nobody teaches yeah. the baby how to dance they just they just do they just bounce you know and you'd uh, have so much fun in microgravity i think i sent you just so you could see it a picture of um we had halloween there's all that you 
have holidays in space as well. And we, we happened to cross Halloween. So we all scavenged up stuff from around the station to, to make our costumes with. And there was this big thermal um, cover for one of the, the spacecraft that docked with us that you had to take off before you could open the hatch. It was this beautiful bronze colored, like metallic um, fabric that I made a big skirt out of and was able to do some, you know, some ballet on the stage. <laughs> it was fantastic. And, you know, and you just, when you can move in three dimensions like that, you feel like you're dancing all the time. You feel like there's a, and, and it's a gracefulness. It doesn't have to be manhandled in any way. I mean, to move that way, it needs to be the gentle touch and the, you know, the rotation and all of this that, um, that gets you from one place to another. And, it does. It becomes like a graceful dance moving in microgravity yeah. that way. I can imagine, you know, I, um, one of the guests on this show is uh, somebody who, who dug the parabolic flights and was mm -hmm. investigating movement in, in weightlessness. And he pointed me to a, a choreographer, her, a French choreographer, Kitsu Dubois, who is basically choreographing in, in, in yeah. uh, microgravity. And it's just incredible, like the different, but I can just imagine, you know, so much of, even how I teach my students is all about how do your feet interact with the floor? How are you using your put? So it's like, I feel it's, it's a totally different technique. It's something, you know, it will entirely be different, different. Yeah. but it's still the same consideration. Like, you know, realizing just how, how gentle of a touch is necessary to get you moving in a particular direction, how just moving your body a certain way allows you to, rotate or flip or you know continue forward motion um it's all it's all the same kind of thing just with a different dynamic around it and oh my gosh you would love it it is the most liberating feeling to to be able to float fly that way i mean i used to dream about that before going to space those dreams where you run and jump and you know try to fly and sometimes yeah. it works and sometimes it doesn't in yeah. the dreams yeah. and from the time i got to space and through life since then i have never had that dream again because oh, wow. i think my body understands what it's like to move that way now i mean i watch my friends i live vicariously through my friends on the <laughs> space station now watching them just understanding you know what that feels like and yeah. and having not felt that way you know known that before so yeah, um, yeah our do brains our bodies it? are pretty incredible do you miss it when you come back yeah, I don't know how you can. I mean, if anybody says they don't, I, I don't understand it. I mean, I really don't understand it. I mean, when I retired from NASA, I had the, the, the most difficult thing for me was that I would be the one taking myself out of the opportunity to do that again. I mean, I was in the line to fly again. I was, you know, I probably would have flown again since then. And so you have to, I had to ask the question, do I, I need to fly in space again? You know, not just do I want to, is it something I would really love to do again, but do I need to do that? And the answer is no, I didn't need to do that again. But ask me when I'm 95, do I want to? Yes. <laughs> and I want to take my family with me. I want to, you know, have them experience that, even if it's just for a, a couple minutes and get that view out the window and make that connection to, it's like you're making this connection to the inner connectivity of it all, this yeah. That whole planet earthling thin blue line thing. I want everybody to feel that. And you don't have to go to space to do that, right? I mean, look, I, I get the sense from what I've seen of your work and what you do and how you're, you know, you're exploring movement and dance and all of that. But you're, I, I really think doing it in a way that's appreciative of what's around you too, right? Taking that in. And I want everybody to appreciate what's around them. There is awe and wonder everywhere. And like you said, keeping your feet on the planet and recognizing that your feet are on a planet and what that does for you, that's huge for us to take into consideration. Yeah. I think, I think you know, I've just been lucky. It, it's I, For me, I've just learned it because I've been living in very, very, very different places. And I, I've kind of understood how big the world is, you know, yeah. in the sense that like, when I lived in Cambodia, I knew how long it took me to get home. And in yeah. Korea, like here in Pakistan, if I'm going to go visit my family, it, it takes me 30 hours and that's just halfway, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I kind of have the sense of that, you know, the scale of it, you yeah. know, it's so huge. 
um, and it's and it's nothing in the sense. And yet it's so small too it's at so the small. same time, which is so. But that does not mean insignificant either. I think that's a really important point: is that you know we might be this tiny little planet in the universe, grand scale of things, like from a size standpoint. Yeah. But holy moly, we've found nothing like it in all of our exploration with people and with our sensors out there. We've found nothing like it yet that could you know, maintain our life that could allow us to thrive. So it's pretty incredible how significant I think we really are yeah. in that grand scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Nicole, I think we could just keep talking and talking, but um, <laughs> it's, it's been about 45 minutes and it's time for me to wrap up this, uh, okay. this show, but it's just been amazing to talk to you. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Check out the Space for Art Foundation some more. Um, you know, I'm very happy that you've met Yumna. It's really cool. I think, you know, kind of in that small world sense, how people come together who might not have ever known each other before. And um, yeah, there's real joy in that. So um, yes, very and nice actually, to meet you. Yeah, Yumna Majid is, uh, she's uh, coming on my show next week, actually. Yay. So she, yes, she's, she'll be a guest next week. And um, all y'all guys watching will get to meet her and learn about her experiences. Um, so uh, yes, um, the Cosmo Quest is off this week. So um, we might have some ninja streams here and there, but otherwise um, enjoy celebrating the end of this year. I, I, I just know that what my plan is to go up under my roof and set fire to things. <laughs> <laughs> Start a new beginning. <laughs> light the way, light the way. Yep. Light the way. I'm just yeah. like, that's, that's the only thing I can think of to say goodbye to this year. Um, it, I just saw something that said, this is the first time where you can actually honestly say that hindsight is 2020. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I saw yep. one that said that's a joke from a future time travel that we just yep. haven't understood yet. Yeah. 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 Well, right. thank you, Jillian. Very nice to meet you and Pam in the background. Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you guys. And I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.